Hello. Welcome to Introduction to Terahertz Technology and Applications, Part 2, with Dr. Peter Siegel. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by National Instruments. This is the second part of this talk, and the first part was in January of 2016. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archived webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter them in the Q&A box on the left side of the webcast window, and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the green rectangle at the top right of the slide area. If you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the volume in the media play player area at the upper left of the screen. Remember, you may also need to adjust your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a file folder. This links to a resource page from where you should be able to download PDF copies of the slides. Now let's introduce our speaker. Dr. Peter Siegel is a researcher and consultant who focuses on the terahertz, microwave, and infrared end of the spectrum. He holds appointments in the electrical engineering and biology departments at the California Institute of Technology and at the NASA Jet Propulsion, Propulsion Laboratory. He's also founder of, uh, and CEO of Terahertz Global, an international collaborative research consulting team working on a wide variety of terahertz research and applications. He's been working in the areas of millimeter and submillimeter wave technology for more than 40 years, serving as PI or co-investigator on more than 75 R&D programs, some of them delivering critical hardware or major space flight instruments. He has more than 30 published articles. Among his other activities, Dr. Siegel is General Secretary of the International Society for Infrared, Millimeter, and Terahertz Waves, founding editor of IEEE Transactions on Terahertz Science and Technology, and a leader of MTT Committee 4 for terahertz technology. Dr. Siegel received his bachelor's degree in astronomy from Colgate University and his master's in physics and PhD in electrical engineering from Columbia University. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the, uh, to turn the virtual podium over to Peter Siegel for part two of Introduction to Terahertz Technology and Applications. Peter? Thank you, Michael. And good morning, afternoon, evening, or nighttime if you're in Asia. It's a pleasure to be here again. I just want to uh, thank Ramesh Gupta for setting up these webinars and uh, Michael Hamilton for moderating today's uh, webinar and all the folks at IEEE who have put this together and spent a lot of hard work setting these up. So uh, as many of you probably know, I uh, tried to give this full talk in January and uh, hopelessly failed at getting through all of the slides I had intended to get through. And so uh, we uh, decided that we would have a part two where it would give me a chance to finish up the slides that I didn't get to show last time. So I haven't changed anything on the webinar. The slides are the same. But what we're going to do is we're going to pick up sort of where we left off, which is at uh, item five on this discussion topics list. And we're going to talk about terahertz imaging. Because last time we sort of got through many of the uh, applications that terahertz has been traditionally used for, uh, mainly, uh, just as a reminder, molecular spectroscopy, uh, ultra-fast reactions, uh, imaging, which people are interested in, and possibly communications, although I really put that into the millimeter wave regime. So today, uh, we're going to start where uh, imaging comes in, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that most of this work is uh, work that originated in uh, my group at uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, uh, and uh, many of the people on this slide have contributed to what I'm going to be talking about today. All right, so let's jump all the way to slide 21, if I can manage to do that. Hang on one second, and here we go. Okay, so uh, 
one of the things that people have uh, really tried to use terahertz for in the, the last 10 or 15 years is imaging. And as we talked about last time, uh, terahertz has some interesting characteristics that might uh, make it quite useful for imaging. Uh, for one thing, it penetrates through some opaque materials that uh, you can't see through in the optical regime. It's also very sensitive to uh, moisture and water and absorption in uh, most materials. And it has a fairly reasonable resolution. That's the reason terahertz imaging has been hyped over millimeter wave imaging, because you can get uh, sort of uh, resolution at wavelength scale in the sub-millimeter range without having to use apertures that are so enormous that they have to uh, stay fixed and span many, many meters. But there are a lot of things to remember about uh, the terahertz regime that come into play when we talk about imaging. And we're going to go through a lot of these. And I hope uh, really to just impress upon you the idea that if you do want to take advantage of this wavelength range for imaging, uh, you have to tailor the application to the approach that you're going to use. And there are many approaches to imaging. We'll talk about a few of them but basically uh, passive and active, coherent and incoherent are the primary techniques people tend to use. And each of those has its uh, caveats to think about when you're setting up some kind of terahertz system. And I'm gonna talk mostly about an example that we uh, had the, uh, the luck to uh, pursue at JPL, which is uh, imaging around 700 gigahertz using a radar technique. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get right into it. And then at the end, I will uh, try to go over some things about uh, RF effects on the body if there's time, and then uh, transition into some millimeter things. Okay, so first, uh, again, just as a, a reminder, Terahertz is very, very, very heavily absorbed whenever there's water around, whether that's vapor or liquid. And this chart from many, many years ago just illustrates that in uh, great uh, uh, detail. And basically, if you look at the frequency range between 300 and 3,000 gigahertz, you find out that the penetration of a terahertz signal through pure water is on the scale of microns for any reasonable uh, signal to noise. And even if you had a system that had enormous uh, signal to noise or dynamic range, uh, my example in green uh, and red here on the screen is if you had a network analyzer, for example, with, with uh, uh, 100 uh, dB of signal to noise, 10 to the 10th, you'd still only penetrate uh, a millimeter or less in pure water. And it doesn't get any better if you look at uh, materials that people want to use imaging for mostly uh, in the bio world, for example. And these charts from uh, two different sources, TerraView, uh, from TerraView, actually one source in this case, uh, in UK show the uh, absorption coefficient or the intensity drop off with distance exponent that you can see uh, in the equation that's circled in the red box. And uh, you should note that that alpha coefficient is in the range of 50 to 150 for frequencies from 500 to 1500 gigahertz, which is just an enormous absorption. And it uh, doesn't matter whether you're looking through muscle or bone, skin or tissue, fat or blood, uh, you're going to have just a, an incredibly large uh, absorption coefficient. And you're not going to be able to penetrate uh, even through the skin at terahertz frequency. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and if you're looking at other materials, clothes or building materials, I just picked uh, two charts from the literature here, one from UMass Lowell on the upper left, one from 
Frank DeLucia at Ohio State uh, in the lower right. And again, if you look at close uh, in the 300 to 1500 gigahertz regime, this is a linear scale. Uh, things are not so bad. Uh, the absorption through various layers of material is uh, roughly 3 dB or so, or a little bit more or less, depending upon the material thickness and the frequency and the weave or type of material it is. But in uh, building materials like wood and drywall, et cetera, uh, it's much, much worse uh, on the lower right we're only going up to 600 gigahertz, and it's a dB scale, not a linear scale. So the losses are just uh, very, very, very large. And you're not going to be using terahertz to see through walls or even through thin materials uh, that have uh, low moisture like drywall. It's just not going to be possible. So what can you do with imaging? Well, if you want to go uh, through the atmosphere at least, for some distance. There are a few windows that you can work at, and uh, this chart by uh, a fellow in my group, uh, Gautam Chattopadhyay, sort of illustrates the various windows that are available to us. Uh, but notice that they're not great. Uh, in dB per kilometer, there are three major windows in the terahertz bands, really, uh, one around 300 gigahertz or 240 gigahertz, if you will. Uh, another at 670, and then a third in the 800 gigahertz range. And, uh, and there's still uh, above 300 gigahertz, you're talking about uh, roughly uh, 10 dB per kilometer of loss. So uh, you're not going to be going too far, but you can go reasonable distances with uh, apertures that are not so large. And the frequency range that we decided to work at at JPL is uh, 660 to 690 gigahertz in the window that you see highlighted in green. And the reason for that was twofold. One, we had a lot of applications where we were working on receivers in the uh, 600 gigahertz frequency regime for planet science. And so we had a lot of technology there already. And, uh, and second, it's, it's uh, stored enough in wavelengths that the apertures are reasonable. Uh, for getting uh, imaging at distances of uh, 10 or 15 meters and having reasonable resolution on the centimeter scale. It would have been maybe a little bit uh, more uh, advantageous to go up to 800 gigahertz, but it would have cost a lot more to develop the receiver technology from scratch for that wavelength at the time. So I'm going to talk a little about uh, this 670 gigahertz regime and the kind of imaging that one does. So the first thing to realize, again, uh, the major reason people like to go above the millimeter regime, which is more traditional for penetrating materials and into the terahertz region, from my perspective at least, is mainly due to the aperture advantage. And simply uh, put, if you go uh, at tw if you go to twice the frequency, uh, have the wavelength, you can uh, get the same resolution by uh, doubling uh, by sorry, you can get the uh, uh, twice as good a resolution by with the same aperture. So uh, just to put it in perspective, however, if you're at 670 gigahertz and you want the resolution of your eye at optical wavelengths, the aperture you would need is seven meters. So that's already something that you're not going to be transporting around with you. But if you uh, want to image at, say, something around 20 or 30 meters, and you want an aperture that's, say, limited to a meter in diameter, then uh, you can do quite well in this wavelength regime. And the equation is at the bottom there if you focus uh, the spot down to a wavelength scale, then uh, you can get uh, resolution on the order of millimeters at distances of a few meters with apertures that are uh, less than a meter in diameter. So that's, that was the goal for us. And uh, I just want to briefly talk about the different types of imaging that you can do. They've all been tried, and they all have uh, their advantages and disadvantages. The, the easiest thing to do, of course, is to do just passive imaging, where you just record the 
thermal signature from the environment with a very sensitive detector. And you can do that, uh, and you can get some contrast between, for example, your body, which is around 310 Kelvin, and the room environment if you're indoors, which is around 290 Kelvin. But notice that the delta T is quite small, say 20 Kelvin, to image your skin in a room uh, at, uh, at normal temperature. And uh, when you're at wavelengths of a half a millimeter or so, even if you move outside, that delta T is still going to end up being around 20 Kelvin because outdoors, although at low frequencies, the sky temperature, because it's passing some of that cold energy from space through the atmosphere, can be much uh, lower than 290 Kelvin if you're working in the millimeter regime. Once you get to the terahertz frequency range, remember from last time, the atmosphere is, is completely opaque, and, uh, and therefore the uh, equivalent low temperature from outer space is not going to penetrate through the atmosphere, and you're gonna just look like 290 Kelvin outdoors or indoors. So that means you have very minimal contrast with passive imaging at uh, true terahertz wavelengths. Uh, if you want to switch to active, which people do in the millimeter range all the time, uh, there are plenty of radar examples in the 94 gigahertz frequency regime and lower down, even, even a little bit higher these days, uh, you can uh, generate uh, your source uh, directly with an oscillator or amplifier in an oscillator, and you can illuminate your target and uh, look up, uh, look at the bounced signal that comes back, and you get uh, much better contrast this way. You can also uh, make it a coherent signal and cut a lot of the noise out by having a narrow band receiver and uh, enhancing the signal to noise substantially. But the problem is you get a lot of specular reflection in this wavelength region because remember, most materials are partially reflective, if not totally reflective. And so even a piece of cardboard or plastic has a substantial reflection. And when you get a specular uh, signal off a flat object that bounces right back into the detector, you get a strong glint that makes it very hard to interpret the image. So what we decided to do with our uh, 670 gigahertz system was work with coherent detection and a coherent signal and to use a radar technique and a heterodyning system to measure magnitude and phase and get coherent down conversion with extremely large signal to noise. Now you still uh, are gonna get glint, but we'll show you how we uh, dealt with that uh, as we go through these slides. So I'm gonna go through a couple of techniques. Uh, many years ago, I don't know, this is probably 2004, so more than 10 years ago, uh, we tried uh, taking one of our planet receivers and just using it in a passive radiometric mode. It's heterodyne technique at 640 gigahertz, but we just pointed our radiometer at uh, Bob Dengler here, who was holding a wrench under his shirt, and we imaged him in uh, a lab uh, at room temperature with a very tiny uh, antenna, only about three inches in diameter, so the resolution wasn't very large. Uh, and, uh, and we just mapped the thermal signature from Bob uh, as a function of position, and you can see with the little red circle that we were able to pick up the extra reflection of the background temperature in the room off of the metal wrench that was under his shirt. Uh, and that comes out, uh, therefore, in blue, as you can see. And, uh, and also uh, his body temperature, which you can clearly see uh, in the facial uh, portion of the image, which comes out much hotter than the reflected room energy. And even with absorption in, and, re and reflection off of his garments, uh, you don't get uh, a lot of clutter in the image this way, but this is, a, this is an intensity image, and so you do get a lot of speckle and uh, a lot of multiple reflection uh, imaging that comes in with this to make it hard to interpret. Uh, 
All right. So uh, we also put together around the same time a uh, an imager that used a full heterodyne system with a coherent source and detector at 2,500 gigahertz just to see whether we could get uh, really high signal to noise. And we were able to get uh, a signal to noise equivalent to an MVNA actually at millimeter wavelengths. We had a, a measured signal to noise more than 10 to the 10th. And we were using this in transmission mode, uh, which is a lot easier to interpret uh, than reflection mode. And we could then image things like uh, plastic badges, uh, moisture in leaves, uh, even uh, going most of the way through a brain, a mouse's brain. Uh, we were looking for uh, change in density uh, in a brain that uh, had uh, Parkinson's. Of course, we didn't see anything. And uh, on the lower left, you can look through a piece of uh, meat. In fact, that's a piece from the JPL cafeteria, and you can distinguish between fat and muscle tissue very nicely. But uh, the, night, the reason we were working at 2.5 terahertz uh, at first was because we wanted the high resolution we could get with this uh, 100 micron or so wavelength regime. But, uh, of course, we suffer on the penetration because of all the absorption. And, we, and this was a giant tabletop system we set up with two coherent lasers. And so it was just a more or less a proof of concept rather than an actually useful imaging system. And basically, after a few uh, years of using it, we found that there really wasn't enough contrast to make it uh, a technique that could replace any existing, uh, at least bio applications. And penetration wasn't sufficient that it could replace things like x-ray or MRI or other techniques people were using ultrasound uh, in solids. Okay, and, uh, and we also did a similar system uh, at a lower frequency where we had more penetration, we had more flexibility using an AB millimeter uh, vector network analyzer. Uh, Bob mostly replaced the software with a scanning system that could record, uh, again, a heterodyne uh, image in either transmission or re reflection. And uh, again, we were focusing on bio applications and geologic applications. But, uh, but as you can see from this picture, we weren't really able to get sufficient contrast in the reflection mode to make this a useful imaging instrument. And in transmission, same as with the 2.5 terahertz, although you got contrast that matches the visible image uh, with the mouse cross-section you see at the right, uh, and the image on the lower left, but uh, the contrast isn't really different than the visible contrast and therefore didn't have a lot of application. So uh, the next thing we did was to look at how could we enhance the uh, contrast and at the same time uh, get rid of speckle and have a system where we could control the image a little bit more and get better contrast. And so uh, our group, uh, mainly Ken and uh, Gautam, uh, had the idea of using a, uh, a heterodyne system in a radar mode, FMCW radar. And although this had been a very common thing to do in the millimeter range, I think it was the first uh, time terahertz uh, frequency range was used in this configuration. And so we set up uh, a standard FMCW radar with a chirp transmission pulse that we uh, then received back in a heterodyne mode uh, through a, uh, a receiver that we built uh, with uh, basically components out of Virginia diodes. And uh, we're measuring time of flight. Uh, we had a one meter aperture, so that would give us roughly a centimeter of resolution at uh, 10 meters distance on a subject. We focused the energy into a spot and then uh, beamed it to the uh, place that we wanted to measure uh, reflection off of. And with this heterodyne uh, and FMCW system, the output uh, intermediate frequency is related to uh, the 
through the range, uh, through the equation that you can see on the top, or, or through the time of flight, if you will, the distance to the object. And the frequency bandwidth of our chirp pulse determines the range resolution, as you can see on the lower left. So if we chirp over 30 gigahertz of bandwidth, we can get roughly one centimeter worth of range resolution. And then by gating the return signal, we're able to range bin and cut out a lot of the uh, signals that are coming from places along the path that would uh, give us either a specular signal that interferes with the image we're trying to generate or some other kind of interfering signal that uh, blurs the image. And I'll give you an example on the next slide which just shows a mannequin with a gun uh, under uh, a shirt, t-shirt, and uh, the image C that's labeled C is the direct intensity image. If we were just to look at the strength of the signal being reflected off of that object as we focus our beam onto it, we see a, uh, a patchwork of uh, return signal, and you can't really make out the image very clearly. But if we can do the range binning, where we actually look only at uh, information from time of flight within a particular distance, we can uh, get a 3D uh, generated picture, and we can focus in on different layers. So. Uh, Figure D shows you where we have been, range been just at the distance of the T-shirt, and then E and F show penetrating through by about a centimeter or so in each step. And then the image comes out very clearly once you get to uh, the lowest depth, in this case, uh, at the position of the mannequin. And the mannequin is filled with water, so it looks like skin. It's it acts as a backstop or a full absorber at the back of the image. So with this technique of radar imaging, you're able to now really get uh, a lot more information from the scene. Uh, just to, uh, again, remind you that specular reflection is extremely important. This is just a piece of cardboard on the same mannequin, and you can see that uh, if you're at a normal incidence, you get a very strong signal from the cardboard. Could be a piece of metal, for all you know. Very hard to determine what the object's made of this way. Uh, and uh, just to sort of quell critics who said you can't really do this if the weather is bad, uh, we took our system outdoors on a rare rainy day in Southern California and compared the signal to noise in a rainstorm uh, with a little bead on a thread that uh, at about 20 meters distance. And looking at the signal to noise on the right with this radar receiver, you can see that even outdoors we have more than 30 dB of signal to noise and indoors only about another 7 dB extra. So the raindrops don't hurt us in this uh, 670 gigahertz. And uh, lastly, uh, or close to lastly, uh, we uh, were able to do multi-pixel imaging in the end. I think uh, Ken is now up to almost eight uh, simultaneous pixels, but in, at this time, point in time, we were doing two pixels, and we were able to get uh, one-second imaging uh, using this technique, and were able to uh, go through garments as thick as, uh, as a wool coat and still see images underneath. So this is a very powerful technique and uh, we thought quite successful. And uh, we actually ended up building a system that we put inside of a van for covert imaging. You can see Ken there operating it. It was a smaller uh, system, about 40 centimeter aperture, uh, imaging at 10 meters through a window in the van, all compact and delivered to our sponsor. And uh, then sequestration happened, and uh, that was pretty much the end of that program for a while. Okay, but it was a nice demonstration, I think, and uh, shows you the potential for at least uh, imaging below a terahertz and getting reasonable resolution with a reasonably portable system and taking advantage of all the things that we do routinely in space science, heterodyning and... Uh, 
reflectors that are fairly large and searching, uh, looking through, uh, through some uh, plastics uh, to take some advantage of what terahertz can do. And so that's all I'm going to say about imaging. And now I'm going to switch over a little bit and just talk about uh, millimeter wave effects on the body. Because if you are doing a system like this, where you're going to image people actively with uh, submillimeter waves, you're going to end up uh, illuminating people. And the question is, when you do that, does it do anything other than direct heating? And uh, it turns out this is quite a controversial and interesting subject. You can imagine it's much more interesting when you get down to uh, 5 gigahertz or even 60 gigahertz, where people are talking now about LAN networks. But for many, many years, uh, it was thought that this could be a therapeutic approach for many uh, diseases as well as for uh, doing things like stimulating cells to uh, behave in certain ways. And so uh, I was quite interested in this as a spin-off from the radar work. And we started looking at what happens if you take 60 gigahertz, which is a wavelength that had just uh, been uh, sort of uh, approved for LAN uh, systems and was also uh, a frequency sort of uh, above that and below that that uh, people were using in the military for something called active denial, which is uh, essentially focusing a millimeter wave beam onto a person to heat up their skin as a way of doing crowd control, uh, supposedly without harm. And there were very few studies uh, above the cell phone frequencies, and those had all been uh, essentially nixed because uh, of presumably, uh, you know, the fact that people love their cell phones and don't want to hear about any kind of damage from heating or other techniques that, or other uh, other uh, mechanisms that may uh, affect your body. Uh, so we started a series of experiments first uh, using uh, rat cortical slices, where we took uh, brain tissue from uh, rat, uh, sliced it up and kept it alive in cerebrospinal fluid, and then illuminated the tissue with uh, millimeter waves, 60 gigahertz, and looked at direct response of neurons to the exposed RF radiation. And we uh, were hoping to be able to do something that people had been uh, really not done, had not done before, which is rather than just sort of expose tissue to millimeter waves and then look for an effect, a health effect later on uh, with some kind of processing of the tissue, uh, this way we thought by using neurons we would be able to actually in real time look at the impact of the millimeter waves as we expose. So uh, here's an example of what happened in the cerebrospinal uh, fluid uh, brain tissue. Uh, we turned on uh, 60 gigahertz for uh, about uh, 15 seconds, uh, sorry, uh, about five seconds on uh, in the, where you see the spiking occurring. And we looked at the action potential measured through a probe into the cell itself. Uh, exposed the whole brain uh, slice with the RF, and uh, and then we turn the uh, RF off for 15 seconds to let the uh, neurons uh, rest, and then we turn it on again in this repeated cycle. And so looking at the top, going from the top of the slide to the bottom, the action potential spikes that you see with very, very low power RF, uh, we're using about 0.1 microwatt per square centimeter. The safe limit for uh, continuous RF exposure in this wavelength range uh, based on microwave uh, studies is one milliwatt per square centimeter for six minutes. So we're now a thousand times below this limit. And what you're looking at uh, as, you, as in the little uh, places where you see the square wave are the uh, 
the action potential firing of the neurons. When we start increasing the power going down the slide, we can turn off the action potential firing. We can uh, hyperstimulate the cell and cause uh, uh, very rapid firing, and we can turn uh, cell completely off, the neuron completely off, with different levels of power that are all very, very much lower than the safe limit. And you can see that the uh, whatever we do to the cell, it sort of persists in time after we turn the RF signal off. So that was very exciting, and we put a bunch of NIH uh, proposals in, but uh, were unsuccessful at every one. It was a time when uh, there were just too many proposals and not enough money. I think it's still like that now. Uh, and rats are quite expensive to work on and difficult, so we switched over to something cheaper since we had no funding for this work. Uh, and uh, we discovered that Taruno medicinalis leeches, the common leech, is a wonderful uh, animal for doing this similar kind of study because it has uh, 34, ne 34 neural ganglia each of which has about 200 neurons, all of which have been very, very accurately mapped and uh, well understood in terms of their response to stimuli. And so with a leech, you can, uh, you can sort of dissect it, pull out one of the ganglia, put it on a dish, and then do the same thing we did with the rat neural slices, that is illuminate with the millimeter waves while we probe with a uh, uh, electrolyte and measure the action potential firing rate. And so here's an example again of what happens in the leech neuron when you increase the power from 200 microwatts per square centimeter to about 600 microwatts per square centimeter. And again, we saw uh, an ability to uh, reduce the uh, action potential firing rate with very low power. Uh, again, 60 gigahertz because that was a frequency that uh, is in use industry. So uh, we put in some more proposals, but uh, again, uh, didn't get any funding. So we sort of have dropped that for the moment. Uh, I just put one last slide up showing that there's an almost ideal system for those of you interested in biological applications that you might consider trying, and that's a Xenopus O site. It's the egg cell of a common uh, frog, African frog, and many biologists have used this uh, cell, single cell, very large millimeter scale uh, egg to uh, do all kinds of studies on uh, genomic uh, assertion and genomic studies as well as uh, lots of other things that uh, you can do with uh, single cell organisms in bio uh, when you have a direct probe. But uh, again, for us, uh, it's a really nice large organism that stays healthy for many hours. And you can see on the lower graph on the left that we've put one of these uh, O sites on top of a waveguide at 60 gigahertz with uh, it's on a piece of uh, polyethylene and then we probed it and again can measure the action potential firing with this uh, organism. Okay, uh, so finally, uh, just before I end, I want to just uh, say one more thing, and that is, although terahertz applications in bio are very limited, if you go down to the millimeter wave regime, uh, things open up dramatically. And uh, lately, I've been working on three different applications, uh, one of which I show here, which is monitoring blood glucose levels using a millimeter wave transmission system in this case, 27 to 40 gigahertz. And we can penetrate through the skin uh, quite readily, and we can make very compact transmit and receiver systems using heterodyne techniques to be able to record uh, directly the transmission loss through uh, various solids, in this case, my finger webbing and the rat ear. Uh, using traditional waveguide techniques above or CMOS circuits below. And it turns out that with glucose, at least, there's a very strong correlation between absorption and 
absorption in this frequency range and uh, level of glucose in the blood or tissue in this case. So there are a lot of applications in the millimeter wave regime uh, that have yet to be really tapped, maybe because most uh, millimeter wave engineers have their hands full already doing all the things that millimeter wave is good at, from communications to radar to uh, all kinds of other uh, imaging uh, applications. And so uh, that will bring us to the end of the talk, and I think I'll just summarize by saying that uh, terahertz applications, uh, which have been around since the 1970s, have really focused, even to this day, mostly on uh, the radio astronomy, plasma science, and physical chemistry community for spectroscopy uh, and uh, for physicists in the optical and solid state phenomena that have come around in the late 80s. And these are very strong applications that are based on natural science processes and are going to continue uh, into the future. They're unique and they're in high demand. And, uh, you know, the advent of time domain spectroscopy has added in uh, to this uh, some very nice uh, ultra-fast reaction techniques that uh, chemists are uh, really taking advantage of as well as quantum physicists these days. Uh, and uh, basically in the 1990s, as terahertz became more popular with the optical community and lasers became fast and you can generate terahertz through direct pulsing, uh, this has really brought uh, a large number of people into the community uh, looking for applications and has expanded the visibility of terahertz uh, quite substantially. Uh, and then on the low end of the frequency range, uh, the advent of CMOS in the millimeter wave frequency range has uh, brought traditional microwave techniques to higher and higher frequencies with cheaper and cheaper and uh, more complex uh, circuitry. And so we're really now encroaching from both ends of the spectrum into what traditionally has been called the terahertz gap and filling that with uh, instrumentation now that hopefully in the next five or ten years will actually be affordable and will even open up more applications. So uh, we've already extended into security and defense in a major way in the millimeter wave bands and in a few areas even up in the six, 700 gigahertz range, uh, again, because of the aperture advantage. And although it's very well hyped, uh, you have to be very, very careful about terahertz imaging and what you can and can't do. And it's very application driven. You, you have to design your system to match the application, not try to do a generic imager and expect it to be used. So uh, all of those things keep in mind if you want to get into this frequency range. Uh, again, uh, just at the end, I mentioned that millimeter waves uh, do have strong interaction with cells, especially neurons, and there might be a, some fruitful work there in using uh, higher frequencies to stimulate cells or in a therapeutic way or even in uh, a direct heating application where you have uh, control over the depth penetration. And uh, we've been working uh, in our company on uh, glucose and several other millimeter wave applications that I think have a lot of promise. So if you want commercial use uh, and you're not an astronomer or a quantum physicist or an ultra-fast chemist, you might think about starting off at millimeter wavelengths and then moving up as you need to into the terahertz regime as the application demands. And so I think I'll end it there. Uh, there are a bunch of slides that have uh, information for people on conferences as well as the references that constitute this talk. So I think I'm ready for questions, and I hope you uh, didn't uh, find the discussion too boring. So uh, thanks again, and uh, I will await to hear any questions. Sure, great, great, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, right, right on time that time, so that's great. Uh, so, okay, uh, now it's time for our question and answer session. Uh, before we start, just remember that you can still submit questions through the Q&A panel. 
Uh, so please do that if you would like to. Um, and we have a, a, a lot of questions here, so we certainly won't be able to get to all of them uh, online, uh, but we'll, we'll do that in a, a follow-up mode uh, after, uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, so first question. Can you please comment on the lack of traceability of terahertz measurements and reliability of terahertz technology? Uh, yes, I could spend several hours on it. Uh, of course, this is a Maybe major... that's the subject for the, you subject think? For the next webinar, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, maybe you'd want to get someone from NIST or one of the uh, standards bureaus in the uh, UK or other countries. Okay, so for many, many years, uh, there have been essentially no standards for absolute power, for uh, losses, for any kind of terahertz uh, instrumentation that you could refer to. Uh, it's actually quite a joke in the space business because you normally have to refer all measurements that you're doing to some traceable standard. And when we did several of our space applications, there just was no traceable standard to go to uh, once you got above 100 gigahertz. So uh, this is still a pretty big problem. There has been some progress. Uh, people have uh, finally worked out, at least uh, in principle, some waveguide standards. Uh, you can imagine there weren't even uh, standard waveguide bands above 300 gigahertz until uh, about five or six years ago when people started working above 300 and wanted to have some kind of uh, of cross-sectional and frequency uh, standard for waveguides and flange standards, of course. And that's, that uh, has been happening, uh, but uh, very, very difficult to get measurements of absolute power uh, that are calibratable to low levels like you have in the millimeter wave, wave regime. About the only thing you can do accurately, in my opinion, is frequency measurements or noise measurements. Those are well-established techniques. But clearly, this is a big, big problem. And uh, if there was money for it, I think uh, people would have uh, plenty of work to do in the standards area. And maybe as some applications start to come online, there'll be interest in making this happen. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, a pile of questions rolling in here, so this is great. Certainly appreciate everybody submitting submitting questions. Uh, so here's a, one that may be of, uh, uh, of general interest. What is used for generating such high frequencies for practical applications? Uh, yeah, I didn't go into any of the instrumentation techniques at all. There are a lot of ways you can generate terahertz. They're all expensive and difficult. Uh, basically, uh, if you come from the optical side, there are direct laser generators that go down to about 2 terahertz or so, but they require cooling, um, and they're, they are sort of commercially available, although it's hard to get a chip that um, meets an exact frequency requirement, and the tuning is pretty limited. But these are wonderful devices. They're quantum cascade lasers. Um, and uh, they were pioneered in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, but now are prolific around the world in research labs. So you can get sort of a milliwatt to uh, maybe several tens of milliwatts, uh, maybe even 100 milliwatts if you're lucky and cool at uh, certain wavelengths, uh, mostly from about 2 terahertz and up. Uh, if you uh, want to get very expensive and large, uh, you can buy a, a sort of a dual laser system, a CO2 laser pumping a low pressure gas. Uh, these lasers have been around for many years, since the 70s, and you can generate yeah, tens to hundreds of milliwatts at certain frequencies where you can get a low pressure gas to laze. Methanol is the one that is the most common, uh, and that's the one we did our 2.5 terahertz imaging system uh, out of. Uh, and so you have CO2 pumping low pressure methanol gas, and the methanol lases and produces a very narrow line with pretty significant power in the terahertz frequency range. Uh, you can multiply up from millimeter wave band, 
uh, starting at 100 gigahertz, I guess, is a, a reasonable place to go with amplifiers, and then using uh, solid-state multiplication factors of two and three, typically, to get up to the terahertz band. We've used that to generate uh, sort of milliwatt-level power up to a terahertz, maybe two terahertz or so uh, in the microwatt regime for space applications and lab applications. Uh, there you sort of have to work as high a frequency as you can get with amplifiers. Uh, there have been some nice DARPA programs in the U.S. that have brought amplifier technology up to uh, almost a terahertz now for low noise, up to 800 gigahertz or 600 gigahertz at least for power. And so uh, starting with an amplifier and then uh, uh, some kind of a multiplier, you can maybe get into the sort of one to two, three terahertz range with microwatts. Uh, there are very few direct oscillators. There have been many approaches that people have tried, but they're all in the microwatt level, uh, UTC diodes, um, some uh, um, other types of, uh, of uh, solid state devices that have been tried. Uh, resonant tunneling diodes, but all very, very low power. So it's a very, it's very tough to get power in this wavelength range. I don't know if I've left anything out, but uh, there's nothing off the shelf that you could buy for, for uh, money that uh, isn't going to cost you very, very dearly. Uh, there are tube sources, of course, that have been around even since the 60s. Uh, the Russians were famous for uh, having a line of uh, backward wave oscillators that went all the way up to uh, above one terahertz, about one and a half terahertz was the maximum frequency. But uh, they require a lot of uh, voltage and, uh, and are very inefficient. But again, you could generate and tune uh, at milliwatt levels up to about a terahertz with those. And there have been some advances in tube uh, fabrication lately using uh, solid state uh, uh, kinds of circuitry and uh, uh, MEMS kind of uh, devices to uh, make the slow wave structures. Uh, klystrons and things like that, more traditional tubes, really uh, start, sort of uh, fall off around 200 gigahertz. So those are, those are some of the techniques. Uh, again, uh, it's not a pretty picture, I'm afraid. Yes. So there, there is an, another related question here, um, and, and maybe this, this is uh, kind of being more specific. I think this refers to slide 31. The question is, what method has been used for the FMCW generation? Slide 31. Let me see what we're talking about here. Uh, yeah. So for this, uh, this was only 670 gigahertz. So here we were able to get uh, multiplier-based sources. Uh, from a commercial vendor, uh, Virginia Diodes. Uh, we also made our own uh, devices at JPL. But uh, you could buy these uh, as uh, you start out uh, with a multiplier around 30 gigahertz, go up to about 100 or so, uh, and then uh, amplifier and another multiplier will get you up to 600 gigahertz with this kind of technology. And so you're starting out at a low frequency, but where you have control over the uh, bandwidth and power and the frequency very nicely, existing less expensive components. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So now on to uh, maybe some uh, post-processing or, or methodologies. Uh, has any work using terahertz that been done using terahertz with SAR techniques to improve the imaging systems? Uh, yeah, so we tried uh, some SAR techniques, at least Ken did, and uh, they they were pretty successful in this 600 gigahertz range. I don't think there's anything uh, that people have extensively worked on in the, the true terahertz regime, but uh, you can definitely do it. You can take advantage of motion, and you can uh, also do synthetic aperture uh, with a scanned uh, system as well. And again, both have been tried. Um, I think in our case, for our particular application, this FMCW system uh, fit the, the uh, requirements 
uh, better than the SAR system would have. But uh, it's not to say that there aren't applications where the SAR would work quite well. Okay. Uh, and then uh, maybe we'll do one more question here. Uh, so did you use any signal processing techniques at JPL for, for the imaging 660 gigahertz system? And what would be a good method to improve the image? Okay. So the that's a sort of a complicated question, and maybe Ken would be a better person to contact about all the things that were tried. While, while I was involved in the project, it seemed uh, I would say that uh, there were no traditional in image enhancement techniques that did much for us. Uh, so although you might think, oh, this is something that optics people do very often with great uh, value, I think at least in this frequency regime and with our experience that we had, there wasn't really much we could do to enhance the image uh, over and above what we were getting with our very simple techniques of, uh, of the FMCW uh, reconstruction in 3D and the range binning. So, I, you know, there may be room for improvement here with some algorithms. We tried working with a group uh, that was supposed to uh, really help us uh, improve the imagery, but we didn't really get too much out of it. Uh, Ken did some work on sort of looking uh, at different ways of presenting the data, sort of edge finding or uh, enhancing various aspects of the signal that came in, but in the end, I don't think any of those techniques really did much to improve uh, what we were seeing with the, just a straightforward uh, technique. Okay, maybe we can squeeze in one more question here um, with a maybe a, a short answer if, if there is one. Uh, what resolution is achievable with millimeter wave bioimaging? What limits the resolution? How is well, it compared to what? Well, the resolution is. Yeah, basically you, you're you limited by uh, the wavelength scale that you're choosing to use. So you can always focus a spot down to, you know, something on the order of a half wavelength, and that's your maximum resolution. Uh, and that follows normal optical uh, formulae, and you can't really do much better than that. There are, of course, things like super resolution and uh, negative index systems that uh, – you know, help you get around this, or there's near field imaging, of course, where you can uh, use uh, near field techniques to get uh, wavelength scales of, I think, lambda over 100 has been demonstrated, millimeter wave band. Uh, so you can do that, but then you have to uh, be almost in direct contact with the, uh, with the subject that you're interrogating with your near field signal. But okay. far field, uh, half wavelength is. Excellent. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, there are still a number of questions in the queue, and so uh, we will follow up uh, with that offline. And as we said earlier, this session will be archived on the Society website at mtp.org, and all the registrants will get an email with a website address for, for the link to that uh, to the archive when it's available. For the attendees that would like to receive the PDH credits, please follow the link that's in the webcast view uh, on the last slide and use the code provided on the, on the last slide of that presentation. Once again, I'd like to uh, give a great thank to Dr. Siegel for this excellent presentation. Our thanks also go to National Instruments, uh, who were our sponsors for this webinar. And special thanks to our audience today for joining us, and we hope you found this been valuable and that you'll return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcasts. Thank you and have a good day.